Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, at whatever time you are joining us for this online worship video. I am so glad you've chosen to take this time. I am the Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve the First Parish Church of Kingston, Massachusetts as its minister. This summer, we are part of a summer worship tour where we visit online services from other Unitarian Universalist congregations across Massachusetts. So welcome, a special welcome, to those of you who are joining us today from our many sibling congregations in the area. I am so glad. And if you are new to the services of this congregation, to Unitarian Universalism, and you would like to know more, I want you to know there is a digital connection card on our website, www.kingstonuu.org, which you can fill out so that we know to reach out and to connect you with whatever you are seeking that you might find here if you make this congregation a spiritual and religious home. For now, I want to invite us all to center ourselves by joining in singing the introit that this congregation has shared for the last year. The words are very simple. We sing, what we need is here. And in singing, we remind ourselves that what we need most, courage and love and compassion, all those things are here with us, wherever here may be today. Please join with me in singing. pandemic compelled us to begin worshiping together in a different way, worshiping across a distance. We have practiced lighting chalices and candles and tapping that little image in the worship web app or simply picturing a flame in our hearts so that when we enter into a time of worship, we remember that together we make many points of light. And those points of light create a constellation of people of love and justice. So today I invite you to find your chalice or your candle or your app or simply to make a flame in your mind and heart as once again we create this constellation, bigger this time spread across so many places, sharing this light amongst ourselves. Typically, our director of family ministry, Jen Shattuck, would offer a time for all ages. However, this being summer, Jen is on study leave. Also on study leave is our small friend, Ellery Churchmouse, the tiny UU who, in non-pandemic times, lives with us here at First Parish. When we felt that we had to move to distance worship, Ellery didn't want to be alone at the church. So he went home with Jen, and in mid-June he told her that he too,
goes on study leave in the summer to learn what church mice learn. This week, Ellery came back to visit Jen, and this is the conversation they had. Ellery scurried up the front steps, panting a little. Hi, I said. You're early, aren't you? I thought you weren't supposed to be back from your sacred place for a few more weeks. I had to come, he said. The birds said, is everything okay, I said. You seem upset. The birds, you know my friends, the birds from my sacred place? I do, I said. They don't stay in the sacred place. They fly all over and come back sometimes with messages. And they said, Ellery breathed heavily, his small body shaking. Do you want to come sit by me and rest, I asked. Ellery nodded and hopped up on the edge of my laptop. The birds, I said after a moment, they come back with messages? Yes, said Ellery. This morning they said that they had been to places close to here where more and more people are getting sick from coronavirus. I said that couldn't be right because coronavirus was gone and after my study leave I was going back to church. But they said I should tell you but it's not safe right now that if we open the church, more people could get sick. Is that true? They're right, I said. I've been reading the same thing just now, that it's not safe for us to go back yet. More people are getting sick, and if we open the church, we could make the problem worse. I thought things were okay, Ellery said. I thought it was gone. See this map, I said. See how the state of Massachusetts is orange? That means more people are getting sick. When the map shows that Massachusetts is green and very few people are getting sick, we can open the building. Right now, the map says opening is not safe. Does it say when things will be better? It doesn't, I said. I'm sorry. Oh, Ellery was quiet. It's okay to feel sad, I said. It's okay to feel angry. You've waited a long time to go home and now you have to wait even longer. That's a hard thing. I do feel sad, Ellery said, looking at me, but, he glanced back at the map, I don't want people to get sick either. If it's not safe to open the building, you shouldn't open it. If it's not safe for me to go home, I should stay here. You can stay here with us as long as you need to, I said. Okay, said Ellery, thanks. Is it okay? I mean... Is it safe for me to go back to my sacred place for a little while? I want to tell the birds I told you what they said, and I want to say goodbye to everyone. I think that would be fine, I said. I can see you've been wearing your mask. Just make sure you keep doing that and come back as soon as you can. I will, said Ellery. He jumped off the computer and onto the porch floor. See you soon, I said. See you soon, he said. In times like these, at this congregation, we light candles of witness. We remember that the Reverend Rebecca Parker says that in times of trial, we must choose our guides carefully. Fear and despair may rise up within us, but these are not the guides that will lead us forward. Our task as religious people is always to choose our guides with care. We know that there is so much suffering in the world and we grieve the loss of so much from missing our small pleasures to the ending of human lives. We must practice facing our grief without turning away breathing through it, because grief is always rooted in love. And eventually, that love and compassion for others and for ourselves becomes present alongside our grief. So we light this white candle for our grief and our compassion so that they may help to guide us. And we are
are guided too by the fact that we can make choices that help to recreate the world. These choices are not always easy, and we know they are never perfect. But choices and changes are possible. We can reach out to a struggling neighbor. We can choose where we donate our resources. We can let someone know that we are in need of help. We can advocate for new systems that take care of all people and of all that lives. So we light this red candle. Red for our commitment and for the courage it takes to continue recreating our lives and our world. Our grief, our compassion, our commitment, our courage. May these be our guides in times of challenge and struggle. Please join with me now in singing hymn number 15, The Lone Wild Bird. Singer-songwriter Carrie Newcomer wrote this. Dear friends, I hope you are well and safe in these days of uncertainty and possibility. She talked about converting her planned national tour to an online streaming tour, about working on the podcast she shares with Quaker theologian Parker Palmer. And then she wrote, yes, we are living in a time of uncertainty, a time when the implications of COVID continue to unfold. But we are also living in an age of possibility, a time when we can creatively envision what a better world might look like from here. I send my kindest regards to each of you as you navigate the uncertainties and the possibilities of your lives. Until we all meet again, be well, be safe, be brave. We cannot just be healed. We must be transformed. To hold these thoughts we will share now in an original composition by Tom Agello, a member of this congregation. He wrote the song, recorded the music, and created a music video of images to accompany what he sings.
Counting all the leaves Looking for the sky Let the time go through me Another scene Another chance to fly This time it's a different sound Cause we know what we need We all know wrong from right We are all the seed water and the sunlight so what about this time build all our lives through each other's eyes watch the rivers rise and this time isn't it worth it just to try what about this time bringing us all along like a family the weak and the strong and this time if we just open up our minds Dreams can go away, something else can take their place. Dreaming for the human race. Everything you know holds you back, holds you down. Now's the time we all let go. We know what we need We all know how to do it right We are all the seed The water and the sunlight So what about this time? Love where it's plain to see Base all our laws on empathy this time if we just open up our minds what about this time decide to see the disparity between you and me and this time lift everyone up high what about this time not hand to hand but heart to heart all across the land and this time every woman child and man what about this time? Couldn't we all forget what pulled us apart before we even met? And this time, no, your child's as good as mine. What about this time? This time. Have you noticed that sometimes our weeks have themes? As though many people are thinking and feeling similar things, or there's some sort of cosmic vibration that lots of us are tuned into. This week, the theme has come up about feeling off balance. My yoga teacher said, we're going to do a balance class, lots of tree poses, and then she said, you don't have to. I know lots of people are feeling off balance this week. Not only those who are doing yoga, but she said, they heard her through the little Zoom box on my computer, she said people on the street, friends, family, everybody's feeling off balance lately. And then later in the day, I started taking a summer professional development course from the Reverend Susan Beaumont, titled, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. It's about leadership in a liminal time, a time when our regular plans and habits just don't apply. Susan Beaumont said a few things about liminality that I found striking. 
First, the definition of the word itself. Liminality is a quality of ambiguity and disorientation that occurs in transitory situations and spaces when a person or a group of people is betwixt and between something that has ended and a new situation that has not yet begun. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, which means threshold. So a liminal space, a time of liminality, is about moving from one thing to the other. And who among us has never tripped on a threshold? We know what this feels like to be trying to make the transition and for it not to go smoothly. She told us that Richard Rohr says, liminal space is the space that human beings hate to occupy. We don't like not knowing what is coming. We don't like it. And I love the honesty of naming this time that we are in now as liminal space. And I love calling it the space human beings hate to occupy because it is just so true. Now, this is not to say that we hate liminal space in general. Many of us really enjoy the stories of other people's liminal spaces. That is where most of the action takes place. Whether you are reading a novel or watching a movie or studying the biography of some person who lived long ago, you watch this person move through liminal space as they go from one way of being to another. It's fascinating. We just don't like being in the midst of the story ourselves because we want to know how does the story end? Perhaps you know the Stephen Sondheim musical, Into the Woods. The first act of this musical takes several European fairy tales and intertwines them with each other. Little Red Riding Hood buys her baked goods from the baker and his wife. The baker's lost sister is Rapunzel, who's been taken by the Wicked Witch. In the course of trying to get the witch to grant the baker and his wife the ability to have a child, he meets Cinderella, and he steals the cow that belongs to Jack in the beanstalk and gives Jack the beans that create the infamous beanstalk, and so on. That's act one. Act two tells us what happens after the happy ever afters. There is an arc of the story that we know, it ends, and then Sondheim says, ah, wait, there's more. A second arc begins and progresses over the second act of the musical. Sondheim opens up the question of the messiness of continuing life after the happily ever after. And then, of course, because it is a musical, the characters learn their lessons, they understand the bigger picture, and everything concludes once more. Now at this moment, a lot of folks are craving some sense of conclusion, some way to end what's hard right now. When will we be able to travel safely again? When will our kids get to play with their friends and learn at their school without having to worry about masks and distancing and closures? When will we get to have church in our building again? When will we get to sing together again? When will we be able to hug each other again? So many questions. So much liminal space. How does the story end? Because we are living in a time of global pandemic, because we are living here in the United States in a kind of very slow-moving, long-term disaster, we know a little bit 
about how the story is likely to unfold. Because we can look at disaster studies. We know that after a disaster or a community trauma, there is a kind of graph of collective mood. In the first three months after the event, the collective mood goes up. People are shocked, but then they pull together. Their mood climbs and their resolve climbs as they experience solidarity and determination to help each other. You may remember the first three months of the Great Pause, as one Boston Globe columnist called it, when there was a sense that lasted until about mid-June that together we were capable of beautiful sacrifice to help our neighbors, that we knew what we were doing, and that this was a time out of which a better world could blossom. This is predictable, these feelings. Now after those three months, which are known as the heroic phase, there is a dip. The community enters what is called disillusionment, and people may experience higher rates of depression or anxiety during that period as that chart of collective mood falls well below its beginning point. This summer is part of the disillusionment section of our timeline. So if you are feeling emotionally low, if you are sad, tired, discouraged, worried, afraid, angry, I want you to know those feelings are all normal. Now, if you feel those things in a way that is overwhelming and interferes with your daily life, I recommend that you talk with someone about it. Talk to your doctor or your therapist or your minister or your partner. If you feel overwhelmed, there is support available to you. But if you are mostly going along as normal and then noticing that the disappointments are a little more disappointing than you thought they would be, that you feel sadder than you thought you would when you realize that those fall plans aren't going to be able to happen, or maybe you or your loved ones are noticing that you are grumpier than expected, that is normal for this time. This disillusionment phase can go on for a while, typically six to nine months. And it's likely to last longer than we think because of the ongoing nature of this disaster we find ourselves in. So just know that the whole rest of this year is a good time to be gentle with yourself. Take extra time to rest Consider Parker Palmer's advice, that while we sometimes think of sadness and depression as crushing us, we can instead think of them as a friendly hand pushing us down to a safe place to stand. But truly, if you think you may be clinically depressed, talk with someone. There is a big difference between being helped to lower ground and being buried or crushed. On the disaster timeline, somewhere around 9 to 12 months in, the chart of collective mood begins to climb again. This indicates the rebuilding phase. In rebuilding, we have grieved and continue to grieve what we've lost. And we've also found some things to be grateful for. We know that the world is different now. We know that that is hard. And we also find beauty and hope. So it turns out that we do know something about how this story ends, which is to say that this part of the story, this disillusionment trough, will end. 
Time keeps moving. We keep growing. And eventually, integration takes place. And we incorporate the hope, the resolve, the despair, the fear, the grief. We bring it together. And we become whole people in a new way. And we know that this simply cannot be rushed. As much as we might like to hit fast forward, it's not possible. So be patient. It's okay. It's okay to move slowly, and in fact, it's often necessary. Moving slowly, being mindful, can help you make this a time as Carrie Newcomer says, not just of healing, but of transformation. Therapist and writer, Resma Menikam, teaches that there are two kinds of pain. There's clean pain and there's dirty pain. Clean pain, he says, is the kind that mends and can build your capacity for growth. Clean pain is the pain we feel when we don't particularly want to do something. We don't want to face it. It feels hard and scary, but we do it. We know what needs to be done. We ask for the support we need, and we move through the pain. Dirty pain involves avoidance, blame, and denial. Dirty pain is the kind that tends to perpetuate itself. It keeps us wounded, and it causes us to wound others. Clean pain, when we work through it, brings us to greater integrity and resilience. In her liminal leadership class, Susan Beaumont said something that struck me deeply. She told us that when sudden change occurs in our lives, a difficult diagnosis for you or a loved one, for example, or a global pandemic, let's say, when those things happen, if we can accept the reality of what's going on, instead of spending our energy denying it, then something important becomes possible. She said, you get to participate in the creation of your new life when you stop fighting against acknowledging what is happening. Though engaging this liminal space is not easy, if we can acknowledge it, instead of fighting to return to what is familiar, we can gain a deeper understanding of our values and who and how we are called to be in the world. Like Ellery, who misses church, but who has reached a place of clarity that helping others be safer is a more important value than his yearning for what he misses. We too can emerge from this time with our own deeper certainties. There may be things we did out of habit before without being, to being able to explain why we did those things that way. And now that we can't simply carry out the old habits, we have an opportunity to describe for ourselves why they were important, and to think creatively about what else in our lives might bring that same important value to life. Amidst the sadness, the worry, the frustration, all the difficulties of this time, we are presented with opportunities to get clear about what we value the most. Gently, slowly, we become aware of the other ways those values
and be part of our lives in this changed world. To live in liminal space requires three things of us. It requires an open mind, an open heart, and an open spirit. And you might be thinking, oh, just, just those three things? That sounds pretty easy. Just an open mind, an open heart, and an open spirit? All the time? Because of course, there are voices that seek to close those parts of ourselves. We just want to know how the story ends. And sometimes we listen to these voices because they sound so certain. We listen to the voice of judgment, which wants to close our minds. The voice of judgment speaks in either or propositions. Either everything goes back to the way it was in January, or everything is awful forever and we'll never enjoy ourselves again. Either everyone has to stay in their houses all the time, or we should just give up and do everything we like because there's no point in trying to do anything for public health. There's also the voice of cynicism, which says to us that that heroic phase was just a blip, that people only act out of their own self-interest. They will never surprise you. You already know how it's all going to turn out. This voice closes off our open heart. And then, of course, there is the voice of fear. The voice of fear is so certain that we are going to lose everything we value in the world. It speaks from a place of scarcity, that there was only one good way for things to be, and if we don't return immediately to that status quo, nothing good is possible. The voice of fear says, the way the story ends looks like this. You lose your community. You lose what made your life worth living. You lose it all. And this voice closes off our open spirits. These voices are so certain they know how the story ends. And in this period of disillusionment, we have so many opportunities to hear them in ourselves, in those we love, on the internet. My goodness. Have you heard the expression doom scrolling? It means continuing to read all these voices of judgment and cynicism and fear until you can't even bring yourself to look away and you think that's all there is. These voices don't know how the story ends. And we can notice them. We can let them speak their peace. We can say, okay, I heard you. And then we can release them. And as they go, we can undertake practices that will open our minds and open our hearts and open our spirits once more. We can reach these places through postures like stillness and wonderment and curiosity and gratitude. None of these postures denies the truth that it is hard to be alive in the world now. But none of them denies what is beautiful about being alive. They simply help us make space for all those things to come alongside each other. I want to close today by sharing with you a song that I have cherished since I first heard it almost a year ago. 
The Lost Words Blessing was written by a collection of European folk musicians. It follows the tradition of Scottish Gaelic folklore in creating a song of blessings. The song came out of a realization that certain words for the natural world had been removed from the Oxford Junior Dictionary because of a sense that children today were not looking up words like acorn and raven and otter and kingfisher. To bring these words back into circulation, to recreate the connections that were being lost, these musicians wrote a song, a whole album that culminates in this song of blessing. As Lisa Littlebird, a curator of modern folklore tradition writes, it is offered both in hope and light and in grief for the losses yet to come. May you be held by this liminal music here in this liminal season and may it return you to a place of openness, open mind, open heart, open spirit. My gratitude to two members of the Kingston congregation, Kathy Kay and Kara Roth, and to our music director, Tony Carlin, for recording this piece for us at a safe distance, of course. Without falter into water. 
to symbolize the close of our time of worship. Please join with me in extinguishing your chalice or your candle or your app or simply the flame you have created in your mind. We put out these lights to symbolize that we are now returning to the rhythms of our daily life. And in this congregation, as we go, we sing the words of Rebecca Parker, set to the music of Beth Norton. The words remind us that we can choose to bless the world. May you go in peace. May you know that you are blessed and that you are a blessing. Please join in singing. <laughs>